Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. My name is Sarah Odsley, and I am the Writing Across Media Facilitator at Vermont Studio Center. And I'm thrilled to be here this evening with you all. It is my extreme deep pleasure to introduce Kylie Galately, um, who's a dear friend and poet. And I'm so happy for her, her new book, her debut poetry collection has come out this summer. And um, the official bio, Kylie Galately is the author of The Fever Poems out now from Finishing Line Press. Her poetry has appeared or is forthcoming in Diagram, Itinerant Magazine, Literary North, Palette Poetry, and elsewhere. Kylie is the book reviews editor for Green Mountains Review, editor-in-chief of Mount Holyoke Review, and a Francis Perkins Scholar at Mount Holyoke College. Thank you for being here, Kylie. Our second poet tonight is Bianca Stone. I'm also so happy to introduce her. Um, Bianca Stone is a visual artist and a poet. Her books include Someone Else's Wedding Vows and the Mobius Strip Club of Grief. Her poems have appeared in The New Yorker, Baffler, and Poetry Magazine. Her newest collection, What is Other Otherwise Infinite, will be out in January 2022. She lives in Vermont, where she is, is the creative director at the Ruth Stone House a nonprofit organization dedicated to sporting poetry and letterpress book arts. And I just want to do a little shout out for the Ruth Stone House and the programs that um, they put on. The podcast is exceptional. They're running a writing retreat this summer. And also, if you don't follow Bianca on social media, you should, because she's killing it in the meme game right now. Um, and yeah, I think that if you're, if you're not following Bianca Stone's memes, you, you need to. Um, maybe we can talk about that in the conversation. Um, all right, thank you again for joining us. Please make sure your audio is on mute. And now without further ado, I'd like to turn the metaphorical literal Zoom floor over to Kylie. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and thanks everybody for coming. I, I love the turnout I see. Also second the shout out to Bianca's meme, meme game right now. Uh, I can't stop. Um, a little, a little backstory of the fever poems for anyone who doesn't know. Um, all of the poems I'm going to read tonight and all of the poems in this book uh, were cut out physically from um, a book, The Arctic Diary of Russell Williams Porter. Um, so all of the words were pieced together or found. And um, yeah, I'm gonna read some and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit more. Let me just get my set list up in front of me. All I knew was fever after a month of no resistance, after I could see beyond the ranges. I know what it is, somehow my own beckoning ceased to lure. I remember clear as day, a bribe of obvious folly, many thrills, anything of a deceptive nature returning. It is doubt raised dire, a voyage describes retreat for human embrace, but be thankful to see the temptation, the crushing defeats, few favors. This domain of mine surrounding the indefinable lore and the silence of many saying go before I had had enough. Let the clocks run down and subside in the ether. It is at home in steep walls, not daring to be released to me. Let us pause for a moment and strike balance. While the fog forges each minute into fever, graves beckon to burn and shape time. But I am not the seeker, for longitude is nothing but the difference between time and the observer. The purpose of clocks is out of my life. Each year, again, I drop into the lifespan well along. I might have arrived in architecture. It came with a letter, I will land you and doubt the spring of the year. I would live over again, merged with the tongue in need of tuning, choked with the monsters of parentheses, but even sound is an unbroken expanse among the greater taking of time and fever and nothing more. I distinctly remember silver knives on the breath Glimpses of the night were at last passing this imaginary line. We were nearing the doubt dividing islands into salt. 
dead pause, the hush, it did go on and on, making pressure to take on skins and salts to generate a slight current of these strong mouths. Some desire too often not to crawl along the memory and return time to time to let this hold fall. I see you loose with me in a snare. Promises have proved a delusion expressed into open water. The loom of our position welcomes the best of the last to tell us more. We never had the luck we were told had dispatched in our souls. Land was useless along distances, scarred and tasted. We started to back out as though bound, we yelled from ashore. The climax poorly charted, you scrimmaged the sensation across a paragraph. What you're taking is the forgotten towering fever that brooked the only wind. What I think, at times of great transpiring, is if you cornered them, you would hear the hole was the vessel, but you think you're the shortcut. Once having a taste upon the tongue that I was never able to name, I ran a mad dash for water, for the first time thoroughly tasted what seemed fatal to me and once quite definite. The return of sunlight that we molded with lamped hands carries along a warm wind, the craved fruit of effort gorged by relief like bread on the table before my son. These pleasant suns of monotony, do you see how magnetically they rise? How the ascent follows as steady as a line of flags? Our faces day and night overflowing the long lines of the new year. Organs reach out from knives and valuable days go missing. What was carved out would have been hope. Precious time discovered at the fingers and uncanny knowledge at the head. The crowd is a miracle, 20 miles it spoons out of wood. Not knowing just what would show up in the year, we soon pick some hundred on the qui vive, heavy with the rise and fall of consequence, dragged considerable distances over affairs to move down runways of staves. Now at higher edges, we make rocks into handles, while the murderous serve rather than go back to the running side of sound. It will not be long before a word is overheard. I shall fill in the deafness of the women who told you to be good with a seasoned conviction that hell is damp wood in a virgin's heart and that gold will always be a chaste animal with skin torn to pieces. I was sore at heart. A lavender tint, my head like tinder, hair raised and stranded. I tried to shout in the wilds of the dining room when dynamite was handled without word. But it did not end. The resounding hammering of the fire your obsession brought you. Two years following to seek and at last we could see the range. It was a horse's back laid with grass and streams for us to navigate. So loaded was the water with silk it rubbed against the night. We made contact with its grandeur and with this we made our way leaving. To climb the thaw, to chance the wall, the axe refused and we returned as though dependent on several occasions. To knife and sketch the wide field where we were bitten with the lure to follow the headwaters, to persist. We were at the drawing board with the chance to begin. We were at the beginning with the rewards of fever. Our luck was not to last long housing on mountains. It was remarkably quiet considering, but it was true. The moonlight forced high in the air as the engine waited for the final dash. Each one of us returned to stand on the black water, hoping to be in that last wail of the violins, midnight announced beautifully. All this framed the oily floor and the half wild music of an unforgettable commotion above. There is a mute room half filled with time now to remove anything of value. Nothing was gone equal to a hive of idle hours, no present sunk there, only dusk. 
the long night left no trace. There are a few names for which no verification can be obtained. The goddess, the house, the guard, the trigger, the doctor, the earth, the infant, the year, the stomach, the anxiety. A normal agony blowing up, the brittle, a gale in all hands, the baby peeking out from her red ribbon. I remember dropping to yell and dance with no protection, never to leave, the hammer moved in the oil, written then to no avail, knowing the gun was my belly, round and wheeled. The bullet she bit at the wound is what ailed. If it was red, you could take it for granted, and if it was alabaster, though coal laden, the wreckage was picked up. The gun was a mother busy with her summer litter, nevertheless bringing us home with her heavy salvage. Young vessels should be at the grindstone, trying to reason with the stronger to swing their own pendulums. Four hundred feet high, I leaned over the raucous cries. None of us caught the eye near high noon, down miles through the fall, soon to lie in the lap of plenty. It was where it was, for it undoubtedly burrowed, the houses of the gold seekers in sand. It was night that crushed the rocks. We never revisited the spot. I have no knowledge of the extreme end of the crater union of man, taken to be a trench that might have been a cannonball, when fossils essayed to go on with the decision to abandon land. I lift the floor in one corner, concentrating on virgin land, no sign of it anywhere, only footprints of the feast, after which I was wise about the taste of oil, wiser about the taste of blood. I am unbearable and unwilling to give up the ghost for its worth in scrap. I tell you I chopped off the head like a roof the storms had blown, regretting that the best was over too soon. The arc light went out and several vague forms emerged. In the dark living room, they spoke to me in women's notes. We are not hunters. Our knives are but mirrors and shovels. They shine so we can dig ourselves out of darkness. But I myself have no food without killing. And when my erratic days are through, I will lie on the green floor with the midnight sun, not under. One woman slid her knife beneath a thin layer of my flesh. Gold, gold, gold. But at times the gold is only a mirror, faintly iridescent, a window full of moonlight. The strange contrast between death and dawn is an intimation of night's secret council, here to let me choose a knife or a tomb for the skin of the magnetic morning. So I'm just gonna read a few more. Um, but first wanna say something about these last few. Um, one of the, one of the like greatest undertakings of realizing this book was confronting the purpose I had at the center of making it, um, which is which I'm still doing it. It I wrote it very quickly and only a year ago, so I'm still trying to I'm still coming to understand it. But one of the main things, um, sort of the the center of it, if there's any narrative subtext at all, um, is in these poems, I call the Miranda poems that are at the middle, they kind of flank the, the center section. And Miranda was the name of a ship in the original text, um, which was about an Arctic expedition. And it was the ship that started the journey, but didn't end it. Um, so I sort of used the ship as a vessel to explore and learn more about the grief that I have learned uh, that I have for former selves and, and parts of myself that are just buried. Um, and so this book is a way to honor that fragmentation without destroying it. So I'll now read some of those poems. I had 18 crossings to the side of the stricken Miranda. When we lay on the stern and asked for time to confer, creating the others who now know that letter, at the time, Miranda, a slight uneasiness was coming. Around midnight, a red light arrived. 
Broken, he was gone, Miranda. Miranda, for us to stand by seemed comparable to few words. Such was their verdict, Miranda, to bless our relief. I have since been told that this fall was born in physics, Miranda. Beginning to give way under their revelry in broad daylight, I remained busy, Miranda, kept rather careful observations. Miranda, I must have been dreaming. Yes, I was dreaming, because the dancing and the night saved us enough, and back we went, Miranda. Miranda was to die of heart failure while ascending from a depth known, but seeing that the faults didn't take, she said, I would not recognize you void. Wait for me until I do. When night overtook, she wrote a memory of former love on a sheet in salt, an inscription long past and in pieces bent split. She then saw what fleeted and tried to reach behind the viscous dark of her watercolor blood. The name of fever sounded and sank below within a few feet of truth waiting in the ice water. The seeds of unrest had at last ceased calling, never again knocking at her through the air. Miranda was a tear in the side of absence with her deviled spaces almost halfway to the moon. No horses barred with her, nothing restless or firing. The last we saw of her, she was undisturbed, deriving knowledge from all their evenings. She who waited abreast the temperature of such a strange and cold steam for the rest of her memory. Let me tell of the hearts lying in a seam a hundred feet long, like mica in a gold mine beating under the simple plane of persistence. I had added fever to fever. I dared time with a knife blade. I did not believe it was my own. I was asleep and floating on a letter. I lay a captive in chains. I stormed the ramparts. I dashed to the very spur. I bided my time and the coup de grace. I had nothing to do with the shipwreck. I would bring back the news. And my respects, as usual, the creative oranges and an indentation in my knife holding hand. My sole regret, a passion for the bitter pill. Mining indicated the demon of mine was referring to the heart, the little known interior already forming in my mind, going along full speed, being drawn down and introduced to tear down almost every trick. There would be something for the heartbreak, the miles of ice and the years of dense fog, anything to stimulate the heart with this profound deduction. The penned line is blank as to just what happened, but the diary indicates I knew that this man would turn doors there and unlock its secret. The ship was the rib of reason. The ship was unable to follow me. The ship was frowning with a fist in her face. The ship was a very quiet widowhood. The ship was nothing but a longhand manuscript. The ship was negatives converted to positives. The ship was now experienced in looking. The ship was an off year stripped bare. The ship was a council of war decreed. The ship was the guttural ejaculations of fear. The ship never happened, but could not be denied. The ship was limping back to swell up. The ship was beginning to be an alarm. The ship was right there on the floor while this book was written. Bianca, will you read now? Not till I clap. It was so beautiful. I love these poems so much. Um, Carly. And we'll talk more about it after, but um, there's something really unique and incredible that happens with erasures that says so much about the person making the erasure and so much about the capabilities of, of language in books that we use um that even when broken down and taken apart by somebody else it still retains such an incredible spirit that was originally there made totally new by this other person it's it's really incredible thing to see what you did here um so thanks for having me read with you i'm honored i'm gonna read some new poems um 
from you. Nature. Maybe humans are the failed AI of nature. Maybe nature wanted something it thought would tend the garden. Maybe nature made something sexy to watch clean the pools with long butterfly nets and a sunburn, the retainers of nature. Now, mirror of mercury and hell, that hot red bomb in your mouth, that sweet battleground on your tongue, it is the catastrophe of your mission. The wealthy with their outstanding educations and custom shoes and empty apartments floating above like Glinda, the ballad of media, the intellectuals almost shepherding evolution, falling asleep in their haunted paintings and unattainable poetry, all the dimensions of each person's being, punk, restless in a loop, Sometimes I want to be taken into nothingness. I want to be burned with the gypsy moths and bindweed, run to exhaustion with the wildebeest. I don't want this phone. I want to kill God. Maybe humans are the complex systems of a natural order that must build and destroy itself in perpetuity. Blue chicory on the road in a sandstorm of our passing, they gyrate and smile. What of our little duties to the architect, our deep red blood, our lush tech, archangels limping in paradise? Alcohol. I am the poor alcoholic standing by the door asking everyone not to drive, or if they've read Lorca's metaphysical cry as torment or resounding ecstasy, embroidering his name on his mother's white death pillow, like Proust in this respect, mother always at the ready, always dying in him, her kisses torn between the teeth like pieces of fresh bread. My eyes hurt to think about it, I'm drinking in the abandoned burning vineyard of a fur coat in the dark, watching the firewall coming toward me. I think I see my father there, fervent, slobbering. I'm speaking, of course, of pain, for I am also the poor parishioner standing by the door, asking if Millet ever found a mouthful of peace, and everyone is starting to sing. My hands on the guitar, my head behind a curtain, my boots in the deep recesses of the past. I'll admit, I'm never the last standing. Mostly I ghost, exiting without a word, upstairs to my little field to wait out the crowd, listening to them, almost making out their words, re-emerging later with a mop and a bucket when everyone is gone. I always feel I must at least turn off all the lights. I don't know if it's necessary to crucify oneself every single day or only when reaching the very bottom. Oh, but I know you. One establishes an autocracy with you. You age as old as slime itself, as old as the first puddle, and you look it suddenly when I stare into a bathroom mirror, grounding back into the usual unbearableness of the body, something supreme cut away from the whole. We only ever wanted to bring you back down from your dizzying, inevitable ascent, and it never works. Once you're off, you're off. That's how it is, depending upon another life form, depending upon ichor to think you can hold fire. You are the wrong bridal chamber stumbled into, strained and stripped with your own concussed double vision of splendor. You look gorgeous in theory. You widow me every time.
uh, this poem is called The Wealth. The truth is, money is in war, not poetry. Money is in real estate and clean water. Money is in other people's money, not pitted antique linens with slight stains at the hand stitch mom swears are worth a lot. Money is in country, in USA, in fiction, in the numbered ether, not square nails rusted brittle to the touch, kept in tin cans around the house for the strange subversive opulence of one day selling. Money is not in our wistful near mint antiques. More critically, it is not in abstinence, in blank space, space between ink, absorbed by a single cell when all the mind wants is to indulge. Money is not in not indulging, not in the flushed ranks of your crippled piety. I will miss money, miss lush foliage, the abundance of summer. I will miss apples and asters and frogs, the smell of weed, the acridness of body when we drive ourselves out of luck with cars. Money is an abstract scream, not the silence that hangs from the head in a broken nimbus, lighting near the edge of what you know. I know nothing of money of wealth, and from the torque maw comes bitter truths, the waiting bird that thinks it can eat the ocean, our becoming that has gone septic. Money is in the oasis, in mirage and delirious hunt. The Request of the Doe. The old doe wanted to be witnessed in pain for eternity. Cut up and bandaged and then cut up again. Fine, they said. We'll see how you fare. They took her into the sterile room and covered her in dirt. They smothered her in praise. They cut her teeth out and replaced them with all gold caps over steel rod implants. They propped her up on her grandma's grave and told her to be still as stone. The stone wanted to be witnessed for eternity, carved as it was like a great mysterious henge. But it was clear who placed her there and it wasn't enough. No one wants to see that which they see every day in the mirror, tricked out and suffering, cut up for no one. Those teeth shone in the night for no one when she bore them at the moon. That was the first time I read that poem out loud. Um, it's good to say that after you read the poem and not before. If you say it at all, it's probably best not to say it at all. But um, yay, poetry. Um, uh, this poem is called Artichokes. Um, Fuck, okay. Um, I bet I'll never appear in a dream or a summer dress or next door. Displaying on one hand my prowess, the other my difficultness. I bet there will be just enough pain to keep me alive. Long enough for the moon to be mine. Just as the sea is of women, the cockle, the star, and the movements of the earth, 
just as the whale stuck in its baleen grin climbs up out of the depths and moves to its hidden spawning grounds. I don't know. What is it to be seen? I forget its language I long for. Man and his ciphers cannot save me. Meaning cannot pile me up with more meaning. I go off like the firework in the yard. I take the limbs off myself and club the air. For the dead women of television displayed artistically in the woods. For the details of their reddish hair. For their always pale and white skin. Their now foul ravaged cunts. Do you have to be thus to be avenged? I don't know. I've seen the last of it, an ache to be saved. There are wildfires switching course to worry about. I take my daughter to the lake and watch her feel the tiny waves. A seagull lifts a sandwich right from my hands. I take out my tired breast. And of having felt like a small event for so long, having felt like an artichoke, scraped away at with the front teeth one scale at a time, worked down to the meaty heart, but with the ultimate disappointment of meager flesh, of being thus, I bet I will live again. I bet I will appear in full gear, the armor of ugly, indefinite livability, the real body, alive or in decay, I'll appear like a thundering, I'll save myself and you and you. I'm just, uh, I mean, I didn't. Um, I'm going to end with the way things were up until now. I'm bored of all the excuses. Bored is Mayakovsky at the Finnish painter's exhibition, barking like a dog through the foreign minister's toast until he cried and sat down. Deadly serious. I am bored as an elegy. I mean, why well, care at all, speaking as a pitfall in a world of pits? But we do, to the death. We all agree to garden this year. In my raspberry bushes picked over by wrens, I'll make them great again and let America go wild. It'll be all trumpets and leeks and lilacs from here on out. Let's stop paying for it, get it free. Let's plan our victory gardens to supplement grief, boost morale as though something new and uncontrolled were available. It is the original new hot future joy and we're making it out of dough. And the illusion of separateness, let it go back into remission. Just look at you. You look like a resurrected child, a serious drama in a cosmic joke, scarred, masked, dangerous. And what of the new Eucharist? How hungry I always am, how I long to lack. Though in Walmart, my heart beats a little faster. I want the world to heal up. And the world is a field as if it were indeed flat, curving and caving, as if it were a piece of paper, a Gustav Dore engraving from the Divina Commedia, the one with the silhouettes of Dante and Beatrice standing in front of the blinding, exploding white rose that you realize when looking more closely is all made up of bodies and wings twisted together, the saintly throng, they call it an image of heaven and the creation of angels, though it is frenzied as any image of hell around a divine nipple, Odin's lost eye in the well, the drain to the other side, joy that gets more frantic the more you try to quiet it down. Thank you for listening. And
Yeah, if everyone wants to take a minute to unmute and give a round of applause for both of our poets, that'd be, that'd be great. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Wow. Um, amazing poems and um, I'm excited for a conversation. And um, if anyone has questions, you can drop them into the chat and, um, and I'll ask them to the poets or you can feel free to unmute and um, ask, ask yourself. Um, I'm not really sure where, where you all, either of you would like to start, um, but I have a question that could be a jumping off point um, or we can meander elsewhere. Um, I was wondering what the word hybrid means to both of you um, in your interpretation of that word. Um, because I, I, I'm aware of how both of you are, are interested in that. I'm interested in your, your hearing how, what you, how you conceive of that word for yourself or for your work. I think it's a good, um, it's a really good mm -hmm. like area of inquiry to, to think about what, you know, these terms that we use to like talk about our genres um, are probably important in like a Kabbalistic way. So we can like categorize them to into book areas of the bookstore or something. Um, but also like there are there are like really fundamental differences between how how writing presents itself and what its strengths and weaknesses are and um like for me poetry is a is a very like sacred and um specific way of interacting with language and when i think of something that's hybrid i think of like adding in one of the elements of another way of writing into it um, and having them play off of each other. But, you know, so, you know, always there's gonna be some elements of like, like narrative fiction in poetry, but like, it's, it's not, but fundamentally, po it doesn't, it doesn't work in the same logical way that poetry um, does so you can't like go too far into um, the mechanisms of prose in your poetry without maybe making a conscious decision to make it hybrid otherwise it ruins the poem um, I, I can say that with sureness because I've seen it so many times in like looking at people's poetry that like if they're if they start doing things that work in prose in a poem like it often will detract from the magic of the poem. But if they say, I'm gonna do a hybrid work that uses you know, prose and poetry, like that conscious decision, um, it makes you able to actually figure out what mechanisms will work together in, in a single piece. And it's like the same with, with image. Um, yeah, Kylie, add. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's interesting that you're, um, you know, starting with talking about like how there's an intentionality behind it. Like hybrid is the conscious decision to put two things together. Um, because I was kind of thinking about it in the opposite way of like hybrid is before you've, you know, it's almost like a step in the revision process. It's like what's not taken away. Um, and that's really just like the way I experienced this project because I had been, really aware of hybrid work in terms of like prose poetry and that kind of hybrid, but I never really spent time considering hybrid like visual poetry. Um, and it happened so much as an accident in these poems that, you know, speaking of capitalism, the book is in text. Like I took the artwork away cause that was like a step for me to get to a poem. It was the only way I could figure out how to write these poems was to like glue them down and have a piece of artwork for it. Um, so the hybridness of these poems was the process 
Um, and it's really bizarre to me that the like product part of it is not hybrid. You know, there are a few pieces um, of the artwork in the book, but like a few. So I'm, I'm still thinking about what that means as I continue working in this way um, and in this form and now thinking so intentionally about like what the images do and how the process is like laid out in the picture and in the poem. Um, so yeah, I, I really just, I really just know it as process. Yeah, I think there, there might be something in it too, to like something about looking at other, not just other genres, but like other occupations even, um, and bringing that into your like poetry practice, like can, can actually offer, first of all, you start seeing the similarities, like where the overlap is and like how they, how they work, like ballet and poetry, like the more you look into it, the more you're like, wow, there's a lot of similarities here. Um, but the differences too, I think, are equally exciting and and each can highlight the other and sort of celebrate the other, um, what the other can do. Uh, you know, there's a lot, obviously like you can, you know, you can get down into like the nitty gritty of like text is actually just symbols on the page. They're just images themselves, you know, you could, but like, we're not getting into that, like deep into it, but like, um, but image is obviously like, it functions so differently than text. But the fact of the matter is, is that text and image are both like super important to how we process information. And they both are important to like human thought and like, you know, our, our day-to-day -day, um, mental, you know, practice uh, of processing the world. And so, I don't know, it's just, it seems like natural hybridity seems totally natural and it seems natural to be very things to be very separate and then for them to come together. Um, but it's, it's, you know, sometimes it's hip, it's hip to do hybrid things um, and have like a project for a book. And I think it can be really, um, you have, you can't lose sight of, you know, the poetry, you know, if you're a poet, you kind of can't lose sight of the poetry. Um, which I, which Kylie like completely didn't, I mean, her, her book is a hundred percent, you know, in the end it's, it's, it's just one is, is reading poetry um, and enjoying all the things that poetry has to offer. Um, yet at the same time, it's not just poetry. So it's fun. It's fun to play around with hybrid, hybrid stuff. I have a question for you about something you just said. Um, just that, you know, the visual is is a way that we process the world. Um, and that's something that I think a lot about in working with visual poetry. Like you have you have poetry, which is something that like every reader will read differently, but there's still a lot that the poet is putting into it to like give, you know, there's something behind it that the poet is putting on the paper, but like the reader is still going to experience it in a different way. Mm -hmm. it, one of the trickiest things that I keep coming up against in visual poetry is like giving the giving too much of, of something in the visual, like visual cues almost, like how on the note, like when it's too on the nose or it, you know, you're steering the viewer and how that really changes the interaction with the poetry or with the picture. And like, how do you how do you steer the, the viewer or reader towards one more than the other? Because it seems that most people want to go to one before the other two. Those are sort of two questions, but. Well, I think you bring up a lot of the good points about what's so hard about like making poetry comics or um, doing a hybrid work is that you can like, again, just reiterating, like you can take away a lot of what poetry is doing by having an image there. So for me, you know, I'm not, I'm not like, my favorite part of poetry is, has nothing to do with images, but what I like to do is to like sort of challenge the experience of um, investigation into our own way of expressing our 
inexpressible thoughts, basically. Um, and I think like using images is just one way to like add to that. And I just got into Carl Jung and I was looking at um, the Red Book, which he did uh, as a sort of like a personal experiment. Uh, it's like this huge tome of like, paintings and that he did um and it's like it looks like an illuminated manuscript um but it's a really good example of you know somebody who's like really invested in um the mind and myth and um understanding that uh that sometimes you need image to explore certain unutterable things um and if you think about poetry comments like that, it can sort of like you're let, I, I, I totally feel you Kylie, because I've really wrestled with it over the years because it can, I, I don't, I find it redundant a lot of the times, the images, and I find that they do take away a lot of the work that the, that reading does um, in a poem and that it's, it's really hard. It's really hard to find the right image with the right text. But there's also like the hard thing is maybe like letting go of everything we've learned about what to expect from text and image together. So letting go of of basically our education in public school, which is like illust you know things are illustrating information that the text is saying. Um, and I mean, it all comes back to capitalism, but <laughs> I, I just, uh, um, but you know, it, it's, it's deeper than that, but uh, you know, we just don't have like a, a society that's, that's prepared to see that kind of, you know, people are kind of afraid of art a little bit. So um, I guess, you know, we look to an image to give us information. And if we're confused about the information it's giving because it's full of ambiguity, like people flee, you know, it's because um, we just don't trust our own experience with art. It's like, all you have to do is just witness it and sort of see what happens in your own mind. Um, there's no right or wrong reaction. Um, and I think, but good art, good, hybrid pieces I think do acknowledge that phenomenon and they will try and be inviting to the I try to do that I try to be inviting to the reader that even if they don't understand what they're seeing there's still like things for them to hold on to things that I'm being maybe vulnerable about maybe I'm being like more narrative about within that that they can hold on to am I getting too abstract I'm sorry no 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 I think I think it's I think it's great and you have worked out a really you know brilliant way of of handling that the way you stage your poetry comics like a lot of the time you give the lines to a speaker in the image and that doesn't right. detract from that kind of illustration-y bit of it you know yeah that's an interesting phenomenon too because it's like who's speaking you know, in, in a poem, yeah. like this a disembodied voice of your multiple selves is like, well, you said something about that, actually, you were talking about the multiple, uh, you know, your multiple selves that you were interacting with and making this book, which I think is awesome, because ironically, you're interacting with somebody else's multiple selves in their books. And then from that, bring it, it's actually a perfect example of, of, of what happens when we interact with art. Like you create something too out of somebody else's experimentation with thought on the page, you know, it's like, I don't know. Um, I'd love to hear more about that from you about that process of, um, I mean, I know you wrote these in 2020, which was a pretty mentally intense time. And um, mm -hmm. what drew you to this exact text? Because it, it's, um, what's his name? It's not anything. It's Shackleton, but it's uh, the Arctic Diary of Russell Williams Porter. Yeah. Did he die? Is this like a they found it on his body or something? Like, or did or did they make it back? No, he made it back. Um, I'm glad you asked about it. Uh, he wrote the diary 25 years after the expedition. Um, it also wasn't like some grand 
quest to reach the North Pole. It was just like he was on a crew with like some scientists. He was a painter and he was uh, playing around with early telescope designs. So he was just kind of like on a boat with a crew. Nothing like crazy was happening. Um, But the reason like what brought me to this was I had had a real good heavy Arctic obsession for like 10 years. And I realized that that was sort of like how over this period of time, I was like really uh, putting the ice on some like heavy depression and like just mental issues. And it was just pure escapism, like reading doomed Arctic expedition literature was like my thing. <laughs> Love it. And so I just like, this was the last of the book. This is the shape the book is in now. Cause it's like all just cut to pieces. Oh. But um, this was the last one I had held on to and I was getting ready to move. And I was like, I don't need to carry this stuff around with me anymore. It still like felt the burden of it. Um, So I decided to cut it up and make it into something else, which worked really well in thinking about like, you know, talking about multiple selves and like uh, past and trauma and stuff. It was a way to like confront a fixed narrative and like what better symbol than a bound book to do that in and mm. then just like tear it apart and make something new out of it. Um, and like, that was, that was it. That's all I needed. That was the only incentive. And then like, you know, a month later I had all these poems and um, but yeah, I mean the, the we in all these poems, is like really heavy in the book and, and always a strange choice to write in the like collective first person. Um, it's used in the book in the context of like, he's talking about him and his crew and I'm talking about me and like me and me and me and all the p- parts of me that I hate or the parts of me I love. And it's just like this, that's the company of the book. Um, and it's just this really, yeah, kind of confrontational, cathartic new thing. I thought the, but you said the we, but it's really the I, right? I mean, it it moves around. Okay. Again, that like that disembodied speaker uh, is just passing through all of them. I've noticed with the erasure books that the I when when somebody does with the first person, it's always much more striking to me for obvious reasons um, because it just it feels so personal and I feel the voice so strongly. And I when I've done them, I've always preferred that as well. It's easier to do. Um, without the eye, you're like, whoa, this is weird. Like I, yeah, it's, it's, it feels so disconnected. Um, but I, what I, what I love is that it, is that it, I feel like, I feel like it's so personal. Um, I feel you in the, you know, as the speaker in the poem so strongly, but knowing too, that it's not just you, it, adds that much more excitement because I think it's good because it acknowledges it acknowledges something about the eye in poetry in general actually because the eye in, in a poem is never just the writer it's you know we say speaker and workshop as like a courtesy even though we're like this is clearly about you and your shit that you went through last year you know but it's like um but you know what it's actually not me because there's first of all, there's multiple, this idea of multiple cells is really taken, I've taken to this lately, and I, and I, I think it's really important, um, but, uh, but that's really what is going on in here, and plus there's this, this, you know, once it's on the page, it's not you anymore, um, but interacting with this other self, this other person, I don't know, it's just, there's something so magical about this project, and a man, too, yeah yeah and I think like you know I'm still trying to to write in that way and like with that kind of attention and openness openness mostly to those selves but like I think it was so possible to crash into it in this book because I was doing one a day so like whatever I was coming out whatever we like whatever was coming out was just like was totally open and trusting to it because I just like I was like well yeah it's just this is the I today and like, I trust whatever that's saying. And so like, these are just, you know, unrevised, like spat out things. And each, you know, each poem is a different day, is a different eye, but like 
it was all me. So like that, that kind of, um, I don't know, like paradox almost. It's just so exciting to think that like, yeah, a day is a self. Yeah. And that's sort of that spontaneity of feeling like, I'm just like not going to edit this. I'm just not like throw myself into it and not like question it, not have that like burden of intent behind you allows for all that subconscious, unconscious work to start happening on the page too, which I think, you know, so much of our like conscious critic makes it so much harder to like get something out. Um, and it's really different if you're sitting with like pen and paper or, you know, an open document, you know, cause that's like, that's a different, different thing, but having like the, a pile of words in front of you that like can only be arranged in a certain, like so many different combinations, you yeah. can try that a little bit easier. It's that limitation that was like, you know, my cheerleader, just like, you, you got this, you know what you're talking about. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Another great thing about doing visual art is that like sort of the tactile hands, you know, usually um, I always found it like, well, I used to, um, not some, well, now I have again, since I'm doing less visual art stuff, but like, yeah, like there's something really relaxing about just like focusing on your hand movements and like, um, it's very tangible, mm -hmm. not as cerebral. Yeah. Which was, and, and that was also a kind of thing that this project came out of was I was covered to toe, head to toe in hives and doing that fine motor, tangible, like gluing and cutting was the only thing that made it stop itching. So it was like, it was a necessity at a point too, just like I needed to be focused on something that was like really tedious. Yeah. Damn. I know. I mean, no wonder people got so much work done back in the day. It was like, you know, you were stuck at home without any electricity and you probably had, you know, like pox or something. And like, you just, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird to think that we're also talking about like, you know, COVID It's just like, it's the same as the old days. It's the same. <laughs> Right, right when I was saying that, I was like, yeah, just like COVID. Just I, think, like COVID. I think that we got a taste of the plague. Um, yeah. Well, it looks like we're at eight, uh, eight o'clock here. So. Big, big Any big. last minute questions for our poets? And I've been really just, I've just been sitting back enjoying this conversation. So um, watching it unfold and thank you for uh, touching on what hybrid might mean to you. And I know that there's no fixed definition and um, it's been interesting to think about that word definitely in the context of book selling, selling books and capitalism in the way that uh, things get packaged and promoted um, for consumption. But I also think it's it's an important word to consider um, to describe something that one like highly, you know, discovered this process for herself that uh, seemed like it was, you know, it was like an intuitive move in, in many ways uh, and like a, a a daily devotional practice and and self um, examination through through the book through another book, um, and that to me seems like a way like a word the word hybrid seems like it's a way to describe a process that is not taught in school <laughs> um, or that an artist discovers for themselves. Um, yeah, and I, it's important to like follow the art right so like whatever like without knowing really what you're doing or what genre fits into like following your inspiration and where the art is taking you rather than being like this isn't poetry I can't do this you know and then later figuring out what what sort of hybrid thing it is right and then just the that the that following that thread and following that 
is really the creative process at work and that you don't necessarily need to classify it in the beginning. Um, totally. This is a nice invitation for all of us, I think. <laughs> so if you're stuck, just try and try something new. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Kylie. Thank you, Bianca. Um, I loved hearing your, your work in your own voice. And um, thank you for sharing the virtual stage tonight together. And um, there's some fan fanning happening in the chat. So um, if everyone, anyone wants to unmute and say some personal accolades, go right ahead. But um, I'm gonna I'm gonna close it down. I'm gonna close down the Zoom room. Great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I also have to say, Bianca, thank you for reading those new poems. I hadn't accounted for having to talk to you after hearing those. And I was totally knocked out. So thank you very much. I can't wait for that book. Yeah. Yeah, everyone pre-order. I don't know if there's a pre-order link. The, the website's in the chat. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Have a great evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Be safe. Be well. <laughs>